Earlier today I made a foray into one of our mainstream cultural centers. Uh, usually the sort of trip I avoid, because the stench of the undead is just overwhelming. But this seemed a rather safe trip, so I decided to take it, and I caught a whiff of something new. Something foul. Some new form of undead that I can't quite identify, but it had the unmistakable scent of platonic dualism on it. And I thought it was a concept worth exploring in a video. Now, specifically, it was a video by Watch Mojo about the ten most over-the-top violent video games of all time. You know, because there's been precisely ten, of course. And what really struck me about this was two games that they included in the list. Number one was Soldier of Fortune, a, a video game from the, the early aughts, late 90s, whose big claim to fame, it was, it was just a video game about being a mercenary hired by governments to go kill bad guys, but its big claim to fame, aside from being sponsored by Soldier of Fortune magazine, was that it had a physics engine that would detect where you shot somebody and destroy that part of the body. So you could shoot limbs off, you could shoot skin off, uh, etc., etc. And the other game was a video game called Postal, which I've, uh, I saw a playthrough out of curiosity. And it really bothered me. There was something very foul about the fact they included these two games on a list of the most violent, potentially offensive video games of all time. Let's start with Soldier of Fortune. Now, Soldier of Fortune is a relatively inoffensive game. You are just playing as a mercenary, and you're killing bad guys. That's it. It just happens to have semi-sort of realistic violence. And that was their issue with it. Uh, they made the point that there, even though we have adapted better technology nowadays, no game has been that realistic, you know, quote-unquote, about its violence. And that's a good thing? You know, like... Uh, here, here's the thing, you know what? War is hell. War is violent. The best war movies are the ones that accurately depict both the nobility and the heroic sacrifices of war, along with the horrors of it. You know, it was, uh, what, General Lee who said, it's a good thing war is so horrible, otherwise we would love it too much. A, a, an accurate an accurate portrayal of war is not a bad thing. What's a bad thing is a portrayal of war that makes it look like fun, that makes it look like something where nobody gets hurt. You know, uh, even as a young man, the show Power Rangers really disturbed me because when the Power Rangers got into their stupid ninja fights with everybody, sparks would fly off, and at the end of the battle, the, the monster would explode in a bloodless special effect, as opposed to real combat, which is nasty, brutal, it often resorts to just uh, being pounded on the ground with no art or finesse, and certainly, you know, it's great to have a martial arts movie that has all the, the dancing, the artistry of this stuff, but it's important to remember what fighting is. It's a brutal and animalistic thing. And so, according to Watch Mojo. The fact that Soldier of Fortune, the video game, displayed the true violence of gun battles, that, that it's not little blood packets popping off of people, and the person falls down and they don't scream in pain. No, no, the violence is actually violent. That was their problem with the game. Not how the violence was implemented, mind you, but the fact that it was violence. Now, the second game... Postal. It's a comedic game. It is clearly a satirical game, where your only objectives are to go and complete a laundry list of activities that you've been, you've been given. You have to go buy milk, and you have to go to work to get a paycheck. It is utterly, utterly mundane. But the game's claim to fame is that you can do whatever you want. They have a button so you can urinate on people. You can go murder people with a shotgun. You can use a cat as a silencer by shoving the shotgun up the cat's butt. It's an over-the-top, satirical, ridiculous game. 
Uh, no different than Goat Simulator, quite frankly, except it's just a hair more realistic. You know, it's about on the same level of realism as uh, Grand Theft Auto. You know, not super realistic, but it, people don't instantly fall over and die when your goat bumps into them. It's a satirical game. It's pointing out... It, it's, it's honestly critiquing the over-the-top violence in many video games. The fact they have a bunch of protesters outside of a video game company complaining about the violence, and then you can pour gasoline on these people and light them on fire. This is a very meta-level joke about violent video games and how ridiculous violence in video games is, but also how ridiculous complaining about violence in video games is. Now, as I've said before, I am Aristotelian in my thinking. And the best way to explain Aristotelian thought is in the failures of Platonic thought. And so let's, let's go to Plato. Let's consider his Republic, where the only type of fiction which is allowed to exist is the fiction which teaches good moral sense. Uh, essentially, Aesop's fables. There always has to be a moral at the end of the story. You can't just have a story that asks a question. It has to have a conclusion that tells you how to be a good citizen. As opposed to art for art's sake. Now, if you take these guys at Watch Mojo, they have two types of thought. Good, bad. And for them, they seem to have embraced this, this modernist the, this college-educated sense of nonviolence, that violence is always bad, that it's never right to fight. You know, that, okay, it's all right to watch Power Rangers because there's no blood and it's kind of exciting, but too much excitement will get you in trouble. Best to stay calm, best to stay medicated. And now what's the, the inverse of that? The other side of that coin. Because by so denying the existence of animal emotions, animal urges, passions, and violence, by so denying that that exists, by pretending we're a bunch of well-polished people living in ivory towers who never sweat, who never bleed, who never shit. The other side of that coin is the torture porn genres. It is the Transformers movies. Nothing but insanely idiotic action with no, no cathartic value to it whatsoever, no purpose to it, no story. Or movies like Hostel, where there is no true narrative. There, Hostel has as much of a story to it as Transformers does. It's tacked on, it's an excuse to have the torture porn. And that's... Those are the two sides of the coin. By being such a bunch of peaceniks that can't see the value in a game like Soldier of Fortune or the value in a game like Postal, they are encouraging the other extreme where we create these things. We call it art, but it's not art. We create stuff like Piss Christ. We create that, that other artist that put the urinal on the wall and called that art. You know, where they're celebrating ugliness. Nowhere is there room for the human soul in any of that. All right, we have the, the namby-pambyism of everybody's happy, everybody's pretty, everybody's on Prozac, or we have the misery and the ugliness and the meaningless death. Nowhere do we have room for tragedy. Nowhere do we have room for true beauty. You know, we've got the Stepford Wives over here, but beauty is about... Being animal, and yet being more than animal. You know, it's being part of this, this animal, vulgar reality, and part of the higher reality. It's both at the same time. You know, it's like the, the spiritual aspect of love and the physical. They go together. This is the Madonna whore complex. You know, uh, either she's a, I'm, either she's a little perfect saintly little woman that never wants sex, or she's a dirty, filthy slut that just sleeps with whomever. 
Young girls have the exact same problem with them. You know, they either completely deny that they have sex drives and go up into the ivory tower until the sex drive overwhelms them and they sleep with the first degenerate scumbag that comes along. As opposed to being a true lady and a complete slut in the bedroom. So with these, with art, you know, this, this is classical, the, the best pieces of art. You know, the fallen caryatid, one of my favorites. You know, uh, uh, Faith, a, a, a beautiful sculpture of a, a hopeful and yet tragically naive young girl praying to God. Uh, these are beauty and ug ugliness united, and that's what gives them soul. Art is not supposed to be a simplistic moral lesson about how to live your life. Art is not supposed to be a reality, an objective reality. It's not supposed to be an accurate depiction of real life. It's not supposed to be a, a moral law that you can follow. Art is supposed to be something transcendent that expands your consciousness. And so, you know, let's, let's, talk, let's talk about Grand Theft Auto. Because that game is art. You know, you can debate how good it is. You know, uh, certainly my friend the Becklop says that Saints Row 2 is a much better Grand Theft Auto than Grand Theft Auto was. You can, you can have that debate about how good it is at being Grand Theft Auto. But the conception of Grand Theft Auto is an interesting exploration of the human, the human experience. What if you were a criminal? What if the, the long-term consequences of your actions didn't apply? You know, what, what do we do in these huge societies surrounded by strangers and frequently frustrated by the bureaucracy? Grand Theft Auto asks that question and then cranks it up to 11. Grand Theft Auto presents a universe where every little petty annoyance that we have is made even more annoying. And they highlight this constantly. In Grand Theft Auto Vice City, one of the radio DJs is on the new music station, the new wave station, and he spends every other announcement he has knocking old people and their terrible taste in music and how he's never going to get old. Twenty years later in Grand Theft Auto 3, he's on the classic rock station, you know, championing the good old days and about rock ain't the same anymore. You irritating twat. You know, uh, the, the talk radio is absolutely absurd. Again, in Vice City, they actually got a guy that writes books for the spiritual section of the bookstore, a guy by the name of Constantine. They got him into that video game to lampoon himself and lampoon the whole goth movement and the whole spiritual movement. What's his line? You know, sometimes on Sundays I go to the graveyard, drink a glass of blood, and cry. Everything about this world is in very bright colors, very high contrast, very, very irritating. It's ridiculous. It's over the top. And so this is why, morally speaking, even though you would never go on a killing rampage, in Grand Theft Auto it suddenly becomes a bit more acceptable because everybody in that universe is an absolute fool. If art were meant to represent real life, something like Grand Theft Auto would be contemptible. It would be a quote-unquote killing simulator. But it isn't. It's a distorted reflection of reality that lets us look at ourselves. You know, on the one hand, it's a stupid video game that's just fun to play, but on the other, it's a very interesting artistic creation. You know, for most of history, we've had, we've had books, we've had plays, we've had poems, we've had narratives locked down. They weren't interactive. But with video games, we have a fully interactive medium. We can do more things with it. And so with these video games that are violent, we need to ask, is this prurient violence? Or is this violence with a purpose? You know, is, is there a deeper insight into the human condition? 
Certainly, there have been some games that have come out that are nothing but an eight-year-old boy's morbid fascination with, you know, burning ants with a magnifying glass. Games that use violence just because they can. And quite frankly, those games don't sell very well because they're not art. Unlike Grand Theft Auto, which is art, even if it pretends to be very lowbrow. And to wind this back to the beginning of all of this, what really disturbs me is that this, this Watch Mojo site, and there's a link down below, click on it just to downvote it, as if your vote matters, it's had 1.8 million views. What bothers me is the, the extreme illiteracy of these people. Illiterate in the sense that they don't understand literature. They don't understand the difference between, between art, exploring the human condition, and porn, which is meant purely to titillate. They are completely incapable of sensing this difference. You know, they live in a world of good and bad, of simplistic morality. You know, they're, they're espousing these beliefs, which they never thought about. They just got these beliefs. They got it from television when they were kids, telling them not to fight. Fighting, fighting's bad. You know, fighting's bad, okay? You know, they, they got it from uh, the college professors, the peaceniks, the celebration of the, you know, the, the whole... The whole hippie movement peace symbol. You know, I'm not talking about the principal protesters of Vietnam. Those people had complex thoughts. I might disagree with them, but I can talk to them. I'm talking about the hippie that just loves peace. That person you can't speak to. They don't have a thought. They, they have emotional Asperger's. They, they are, are spiritually bereft. They are, they're human cockroaches. They're not people. 1.8 million views. As I said, I, I don't know exactly what it is I, I, I smelled there. You know, um, definitely foul. Definitely some form of undead. Not quite sure what it is. But it really bothers me on a deep level that this is the the level of cultural discourse that we've descended to. Arrhenio, folks.